Simon Carey is a business owner and historian, and he is the great grand nephew of Pearl Chase. Simon is also the 11th Earl of Carey. He was educated at Eton College and Cambridge University, where he earned a master's in archaeology. He also earned an MBA from Holt Ashbridge and a PhD in history from the University of East Anglia. I'm probably saying all this incorrectly, Simon, so please feel free to correct it later. He is the author of Lounsdown, the, late, the Last Great Wig, a book about his great-great-grandfather. Simon lives in Bowood in Wiltshire, a 17th century country house, and devotes most of his time to managing the estate. He serves on various local, local and regional boards and committees. And we were very pleased to meet Simon while he was researching his current book in the Gled Hill Library. So without further ado, come on up, Simon. So good evening. I'm very grateful to all who organized this event and to you all for being here in this special place. Pearl considered history one of her primary interests and that maintaining tradition was essential to the health of a community. The Santa Barbara Historical Museum continues this tradition, preserving and sharing the rich history of this region. I'm especially grateful to Sharon Bradford, Daisha Harwood, and Emily Alicio, who have done so much to organize everything. When I started my work on Pearl Chase, I started my work on Pearl Chase by asking questions the same questions I'm asked by those I meet. Why a biography of Pearl? What made her special? I have long been fascinated by my American ancestors. Every family has its high achievers, and Pearl Chase, who was my great-grand aunt, was her family's preeminent example. One of the concerns a biographer has is insufficient material to work with. I was fortunate that this wasn't so with Pearl. She saved everything. I found an extensive resource here in Santa Barbara and in many other places across America. As I set to work, I, set many, I met many people who'd heard of her and many who hadn't. I wanted to remind people of this remarkable woman and her vision. In 1907, age 19, on her way home from University California, Berkeley, Pearl stepped off the train in Santa Barbara and had a moment of realization. Looking around, she was ashamed of the city's shabby buildings dirty streets and poor landscaping. There and then, she resolved to dedicate herself to making her environment a much better place to live. In one sense, her vision was simple. For people to be happy, they had to live in uplifting environment, and so they must feel ownership of their communities. Communicate, cooperate, and coordinate were her three watchwords, and where possible, she worked with power rather than against it. Her clear thinking and persuasiveness made even the most hard-headed men come round to her point of view. For over 70 years, her vision endured, and she established herself as Santa Barbara's woman of the 20th century. From championing the rights of Native Americans to town planning, the wilderness conservation, the preservation of California's Spanish heritage, and the spirit of volunteerism, there were few areas of her community's life that Pearl didn't have a hand in shaping. We begin with Pearl's extraordinary personality and character, forged within the vibrant, happy household created by her parents. Their strong Baptist faith, ability to rise above adversity, and service within the local community and in business ventures gave Pearl an inner security, strength, and maturity that inspired her constantly to look outwards to others. We see this repeatedly. She's the model of a great leader. Rather than focus on her own achievements, she humbled herself in serving others while tenaciously standing up to prejudice and injustice and dealing with difficulties head on. This unusually gifted woman with fierce intelligence respected others, whoever they were, whatever their background and faith, listening and caring for them and discerning their needs. She had special respect for women inspiring, mobilizing, and spurring them to harness their gifts and talents for the good of others. She saw potential in everyone. Her strong character and personal qualities formed the bedrock of her life and shaped her activities. 
With her strong aesthetic impulse, interest in architecture, heritage, conservation, and the built and natural environment, she had an exceptional instinct for knowing what was best for people to flourish. This insight recognized that our surroundings are crucial for both our physical and emotional health, and that the interplay between the two needed to be nurtured. And she saw education as key to unlocking the means to achieve her aims. Pearl's ideas weren't spawned in isolation. They arose from the wider context of social and architectural movements that aimed to develop urban landscapes so that communities thrived and well-being flourished. When she met resistance against many of her campaigns, her fortitude, clear vision, and single-mindedness spurred her to pursue her goals, where many other would flounder. So what can we learn from Pearl, her pioneering activities, and the causes to which she tirelessly devoted herself? What is the enduring legacy of this remarkable woman? Pearl's formative years were spent mainly in Santa Barbara, a thriving tourist town and an exciting place to live. Her father was an ex successful realtor and member of the local chamber of commerce and several community boards. An effective communicator, he was one of the city's key movers and shakers. Her mother was involved in local committees and the cottage hospital, using her talents for the community. There's no doubt they served as examples of good citizens, not only to fellow Santa Barbarans, but also to their children, Pearl and Harold. It was in 1905 that Pearl moved from this close-knit family and community to study history at the University of California, Berkeley, for which she received highest distinction. Returning to Santa Barbara, she pursued a short career as a teacher before moving into social work. Her education and teacher training provided her with a solid foundation to build on. She became involved in projects to improve the local environment. Before long, the impact of the First World War brought with it economic difficulties. This didn't deter Pearl. She saw the problems and looked for solutions. She proposed the creation of a community chest in Santa Barbara, which led to local fundraising organizations forming a financial federation to collect and distribute funds more efficiently. It also encouraged ordinary people to embrace community service as a civic obligation. After the war, a number of compassionate and generous philanthropists and cultural leaders settled in Santa Barbara, bringing a can-do attitude. Pearl was buoyed by their desire to build a new world. These wealthy incomers not only brought a new way of life and leisure, they acknowledged their civic responsibilities. This culture of giving is still evident in Santa Barbara today. They drew upon the talents of artists, architects, cultural educators, designers, and community organizers, and stimulated the creation of the Community Arts Association, founded in 1921. With Pearl as its leading light, it supported many art forms, including drama, art, music, and plans and planting. Through her plans and planting committee, Pearl closely followed the Better Homes in America movement that advocated for home ownership and the ability of individuals to live in beautiful surroundings. Pearl had no hesitation putting herself forward as Santa Barbara's chairperson in the 1925 National Better Homes competition, seeing it as extending the work she was already doing. Pearl and her co-campaigners successfully inspired local citizens to envision a beautifully designed city of fine architecture and green spaces. Little did they know that it would take a natural disaster for their ideas to become reality. On June 29, 1925, an earthquake measuring 6.3 on the Richter scale ripped through the city. In a quirk of circumstance, the earthquake made possible Pearl and her plans and planting committee's vision of building in a unified Spanish colonial revival style. Confronted with a massive rebuilding effort, city leaders looked to them for assistance. Their vision for Santa Barbara was not only realized, but handsomely rewarded. In 1925, the city won joint first prize with Atlanta, Georgia in the Better Homes contest. This was official recognition that Santa Barbara was one of the most beautiful residential areas in the US. Plans and Planting's focus on the built environment was complemented by its concern for the natural environment. 
Spurred by Pearl's vision, members organized garden tours, lectures, exhibitions on gardening and landscape design, flower shows and competitions for floral arrangement and small garden design. Pearl's reputation for successful town planning and positive change was becoming widely recognized, aided by the fact that between 1925 and 1942, the city won either first prize or merit in the Better Homes competition 13 times out of 16. She was in demand, adv advising communities beyond Santa Barbara on planning and community betterment. The city was making a vital contribution to the Better Homes movement, influencing the housing and home lives of families throughout America. The city so impressed Herbert Hoover that in 1928 he made a campaign stop at Santa Barbara before going on to win a landslide presidential victory. The 1929 stock market crash reverberated through the nation, heralding huge change in economic fortunes. As America grappled with the Great Depression that followed, the housing crisis was clearly acute. Many believed an upturn in construction was key to economic recovery. President Hoover announced a conference on home building and home ownership, primarily to assess the state of housing throughout the US and to suggest solutions. Several committees were commissioned to carry out research and report to the conference. Pearl was appointed chairman of the Committee on Home Information Services and Centers. She delivered her paper in Washington in December 1931, sharing the platform with other dynamic high-profile women, such as Mrs. Henry Ford, president of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association. Pearl's expertise was soon again in demand, this time on the subject of roadside advertising throughout California. Against powerful opposition, Pearl and like-minded compatriots campaigned against the installation of advertising boards and urged for the creation of specific zone areas where advertising could be contained. Despite the opposition, Pearl and their fellow campaigners eventually won through. In 1934, Pearl established the Santa Barbara Roadside Council, encouraging the citizens of Santa Barbara County to express their views on highway safety park and highway improvement, and community beautification. Pearl was also keen to nurture cooperation between official civic and commercial agencies, acting for environmental improvements in the region. A competition for the improvement of Santa Barbara County service stations was an immediate success and resulted in buildings that were truly architectural gems. Pearl often argued, good style is good business. The oil companies listened and agreed. The absence of billboards and the attractive landscaping is part of Pearl's lasting legacy. Today, the stretch of 101 between El Rincon and the Gaviota Pass is widely regarded as one of the most attractive in California. One of Pearl's interests was the conservation of natural resources. She was one of many who challenged unregulated 19th century development and investigated how best to conserve the natural environment. A growing movement of activists who had emerged in the early 20th century found in the newly formed Yosemite National Park an opportunity to debate what the designation of a national park actually meant. This wasn't easy. A bitter battle was fought against businesses and local government intent on building a dam in the Hetch Hetchy Valley within the park. The mayor of San Francisco believed it his civic responsibility to provide constituents with an abundant source of water. Pearl and fellow members of the Santa Barbara Women's Club, together with the wider General Federation of Women's Clubs, opposed the dam's development, believing that the beauty of the entire park should be enjoyed by everyone. Congress finally passed the Raker Act, which allowed the flooding of the valley on condition that the power and water could only be used for public interests. Although the opponents had to concede, they formed a powerful lobby. With their vast network, the hiking, outdoor, and women's clubs made a significant impact in promoting the preservation of parks and wildlands. Many women believed that, quote, man the moneymaker had left it to woman the money saver to preserve resources. Committing herself to the wider conservation movement, Pearl involved herself with the California State Park Movement. Her influence and expertise recognized in 1929 when she was appointed a director of the National Conference on State Parks. Fittingly, she was also invited to serve as an advisor to the National Park Service, 
that fostered the growth and unification of the state park system. Pearl continued to devote her time, talents, and organizational abilities to Santa Barbara's environmental priorities. She joined the Garden Club of Santa Barbara in Montecito, where she found a group of eager women keen to promote local conservation. In 1933, Pearl's suggestion that the city should hold a conservation week was enthusiastically met. Conservation week was a great success, so in 1934, Pearl expanded the campaign. Soon, the California Conservation Council was established, with Pearl as president, overseeing a committee of experts in conservation. The council administered the annual California Conservation Week, and it was so successful that by 1940, over 5,000 people were involved. In 1943, Pearl again expanded her program for conservation education in the state, aiming to make people aware of how their wealth depended on natural resources and to demonstrate the relationship between nature and human economy. In 1950, she co-authored with the California Department of Natural Resources the Guidebook for Conservation Education. It was approved for use in the schools of California, and in 1953, the Conservation Education Association was formed. Pearl was in her element, working in common cause with experts and public officials. The seed of her vision became a flourishing forest of activity. She had determination, drive, and motivation as she sought to stimulate wider concern for the natural environment. This is something we need to wholeheartedly embrace today, especially as we see the impact of climate change. And then I'm just going to ad lib, but look at the rain this evening. <laughs> and we need to implement Pearl's desire for education in such matters. Pearl had a special concern for Native Americans, who were the users and stewards of the land, and who were affected by environmental change and the introduction of new technologies. Pearl's initiation into the Native American reform movement took place in 1923 through her connection with the Women's Club movement. With others, they fought against the eradication of American Indian communities. In June 1923, she helped organize a conference in Santa Barbara from which the Santa Barbara branch of the Indian Defense Association was created. Pearl became its president. Their aims were to secure the right to land, legal and health protection, education, and liberty of conscience for all Native Americans. Its success inspired others to set up similar associations. Again, we see Pearl's hand in shaping attitudes and emboldening people with the strength to fight injustice in the face of opposition. As an educator and reformer, she worked tirelessly in their struggle for civil rights. And as a fundraiser, she supported Native American affairs all her life. We see Pearl's compassion in her work with La Parisima Mission, a project that would create a lasting legacy and bring her into contact with the Civilian Conservation Corps, established by President Roosevelt in 1933. It became evident that one of these CCC camps could be created in Santa Barbara County through the restoration of La Parisima Mission. With careful planning, the buildings could be restored in cooperation with the State Division of Parks. Unsurprisingly, Pearl was invited to join La Parisma Advisory Committee. She was perfectly suited, given her keen interest in historic preservation and her connection with those actively involved in building restoration. By September 1941, the complex was complete. It boasted lovingly restored mission buildings, sympathetic with the original architecture a four-acre mission garden planted with authentic plants and surrounding parkland created for the benefit of the local community and visitors. The entry of the United States into World War II brought new challenges and opportunities. When there were calls for citizens to contribute to the war effort, Pearl's unique qualities were commandeered yet again. She recruited and organized volunteer teams she didn't have to work very hard to find willing female volunteers. Many rushed forward to help. The camaraderie increased morale, enabling the women to feel connected to one another. In everything she did, Pearl looked to the needs of others, determined to improve their lives however she could, and employed her considerable talents in every venture with which she engaged. From the end of the war to 1950, the population of Santa Barbara surged. New residential and commercial developments were planned and permitted. 
but Pearl was dismayed by some of the proposals to develop Santa Barbara in modern style, a betrayal of the commitment to the city's predominant architecture. Pearl characteristically persisted in challenging the status quo, but to no avail. Many of the older buildings were demolished to make way for modern development. This period of growth and abundance experienced throughout California also had an impact on the environment and came with a price. The wilderness areas loved by Pearl and her fellow conservationists were increasingly forced to yield to expanding infrastructure. Countering such development, scientists and activists implored the authorities and developers to consider the consequences. They urged for nature and biodiversity to be preserved and protected. Pearl, through collaboration with conservation organizations, including the Isaac Walton League, the Sierra Club, and California State Parks, helped shape the dialogue. She was particularly dedicated to Save the Redwoods League, having been elected one of its councillors in 1953. Their aim was to save the two million acres of redwoods that remained in private hands along California's coast. Shifting attitudes in conservation practices established during the Kennedy administration were advanced when Johnson became president. He boldly declared that the beautiful land he dreamed of wasn't to be a luxury for the fortunate, but a birthright for every American, an aspiration he shared with the First Lady. His work brought him recognition in conservation circles. What Pearl and others had been tirelessly advocating for locally was finally finding expression nationally. In 1965, Johnson organized a White House conference on natural beauty, inviting 800 delegates from across the nation to participate. Pearl was an honored guest. Her input, as well as that from other delegates, was vital in shaping policy and future directions. Not only was the conference a success, it was a watershed, forming a bridge between traditional conservationism and the new environmentalism. It enlivened the California roadside reform movement, through letter writing, petitions, lobbying, and education, Pearl and her co-activists were justifiably proud of their achievements. But it came with a price. They faced blatant and belittling sexism. Even the president's wife wasn't immune. When her husband signed the Highway Beautification Act in 1965, some senators derogatively nicknamed it Ladybird's Bill and described it as a frivolous frill and a woman's whim. Pearl and other Santa Barbara activists weren't cowed by the senseless sentiments of their detractors. Inspired by the National Beautification Movement, in 1965 they formed a non-profit organization called Santa Barbara Beautiful. They invited civic groups and local citizens to join them in a city enhancement program. At this time, President Johnson's vision for the Great Society stimulated a growing interest in the nation's historic resources. In 1966, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act, legislating that each state would have its own historic preservation office. This chimed with the vision that had kept Pearl and her fellow campaigners active for so long. They continued to champion Santa Barbara's historic buildings, opposing demolition in the name of progress. Pearl focused on the deteriorating Presidio, the last fortress in California that was built by the Spanish in 1782. Here was an opportunity to preserve and restore this architecturally and historically important edifice and its surroundings. Pearl organized lectures, presentations, and exhibitions as a means of engaging with the local community, inviting citizens to become involved in planning and adopt her ideas for creating special preservation zones. Local residents and the city's leading citizens alike were energized by her proposals, and within two years, Santa Barbara and officials decreed the El Pueblo Viejo Ordinance, which prohibited the demolition of any building of special historic or aesthetic interest or value. Pearl was determined that the Presidio should be the focus of this revival. In 1963, she founded the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation as the primary force in the reconstruction and preservation of the site. Through her role, she guided the project's narrative, brought the right players to the discussions, and applied the power and resources of state government. The project came to fruition in 1966, when El Presidio became a state historic park. Then, as now, it served the community and acted as a tourist attraction. In the late 1960s, Pearl turned her attention to the problems in the San Rafael wilderness, located 12 miles north of Santa Barbara. 
This stunning area, characterized by remote, wild, and rugged landscapes, was at risk of damage from motorbike riders running up and down the trails on their vehicles. Pearl joined an ad hoc committee of local residents, which campaigned for the protection of an area covering nearly 150,000 acres of the wilderness. But this was 40,000 acres more than the Forest Service was prepared to accede. It took a public meeting and consultation period for the Forest Service to capitulate in the face of the overwhelming evidence that the majority of locals supported a larger area of protection. Once again, people power, combined with commitment and dedication of activist leaders, brought about change. Disenchantment with environmental neglect found expression in 1969 when an environmental disaster hit. A blowout on an oil rig five and a half miles off the coast of Santa Barbara led to three million gallons of crude oil being spilled into the channel and onto the beaches of Santa Barbara County. The cleanup involved hundreds of volunteers and took workers months to complete. It cost millions of dollars. The anguish felt by local residents coping with the disaster galvanized some of them into activists working to protect the environment. These individuals saw Pearl's support as vital. They regarded her as activist emeritus, her name and voice carrying such weight and authority. Their work didn't go unheeded. President Nixon began an ambition ambitious pollution-fighting agenda, creating the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency. One of the most remarkable outcomes of the global environmental movement inspired by events in Santa Barbara was Earth Day. By this time, Pearl was reaching her 80s. Undeterred, she continued to pursue her vision of people living healthy lives within a happy environment and was still involved in campaigning. She successfully led a campaign against the building of two high-rise condominiums in the city. The victory was all the more remarkable, given that it had the backing of the most powerful citizens in Santa Barbara. Pearl's lifelong contribution to so many environmental and cultural causes attracted tributes from far and wide. In 1972, the University of California, Santa Barbara, dedicated part of the campus to her, calling it the Pearl Chase Garden, located on the banks of the lagoon. Pearl was thrilled and humbled. Her relationship with the University of California since her admission to Berkeley had been one of the most fulfilling and rewarding aspects of her career. For her services to, to the university, in particular for her work to get Santa Barbara State College into the UC system, and for developing the UCSB campus at Galita, she was awarded in 1959 an honorary doctorate of humane letters. Pearl was the first woman to receive such a prestigious honor from UCSB. The university also welcomed into their special research collection the archive of material relating to her civic work so that this historic asset could be made publicly accessible. In 1973, Pearl received an award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation for her service to historic preservation and ecological planning in Santa Barbara and throughout California. It was presented by Patricia Nixon, the US First Lady. On hearing about Pearl's association with the trust, President Nixon sent Pearl a signed copy of the proclamation that designated the week of May 6 to 12 as National Historic <coughs> Preservation Week. In 1978, the city council changed the name of Santa Barbara's Palm Park to Chase Palm Park. This 10-acre oceanfront park had stunning views and amenities for the community. Pearl was delighted, regarding it as one of the great scenic and recreational assets of the city. Pearl spent her final years surrounded by friends, admired by her community, and honored by her state and country. She continued to attend committee and public meetings until her final days with boundless energy and dedication. On October 24, 1979, after two mild strokes, Pearl died quietly at home three weeks before her 91st birthday. The accolades flowed, recognizing the magnificent contribution she had made. Her legacy remains strong. Her memory is kept alive through the many organizations that she influenced, which continue to thrive. In 1965, Newton Drury, fourth director of the National Park Service, said of Pearl, probably no other person in the United States over so long a period of years has been as effective as Pearl Chase in awakening the American consciousness to the need of conservation in all its phases. Thank you very much.